Hello and welcome to Transforming Tomorrow, the podcast from the Pentland Centre for Sustainability in Business here at Lancaster University Management School. I'm Paul Turner. And I'm Professor Jane Bevington. It's been a while, Jan, since we've discussed a task force. I feel we need to talk about task forces today. Well, I think you're in for a treat then, but also it's not been so long since we talked about biodiversity and nature. So we are going to talk about the Task Force on Nature-Related Financial Disclosures, TNFD. And I shall refer to it as TNFD throughout this episode because, frankly, the Task Force on Nature-Related Financial Disclosures is getting a bit of a mouthful. Now, you recall in the last episode we spoke with Tim Lamont a lot of discussion there about companies and their effects on nature and how they can help nature and nature restoration. It is indeed, and the task force is something different again, and um, our guest will undoubtedly take us through its elements. So it, it has some element of restoration in it, but it's much broader. And it, as a task force, it, it kind of, you know, the label's there. So a group of people got together to try to promote and to describe a particular approach to dealing with nature and biodiversity. So it's a pretty new task force and it's pretty exciting, but I'm not the person who ought to be telling us about it. Our guest is the expert. Yes, let's find out what that task force is, who is involved and what it does by welcoming Dr. Netola Chifche, who is a postdoctoral research associate in business and biodiversity at the Pentland Centre for Sustainability in Business. Normally we have to give a totally different place that he's a part of and he happens to be a member, but no, Neo, you are part of the Pentland Centre. Uh, Neil, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. As I said, I work here at the Pantheon Center with Jim Livington. My background, including my master and PhD degrees and also my research interests, all about accounting and finance, I can say. Like uh, my current research interests is all about biodiversity with Jim Livington. So what I am doing at the Pantheon Center, so we are working on some projects. One of them, for example, uh, looking at biodiversity scenario analysis with ICAEW. It stands for Institute for Chartered Accountants Chartered in, England and Wales. in England and Wales. That's right. <laughs> See, we've got, we've got Paul yeah. drawn into our world. He knows all the yes. acronyms there. Yes, my, my life is so much better now. I know all the intricacies <laughs> of accounting. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Neil, Sorry. you go on. <laughs> Thank you. It's ICAW. So uh, we are working uh, with them to look at companies' biodiversity scenario practices to understand at which stage they are and uh, what they are doing right now. And also uh, we, pr- we produced a scenario guidance to provide them some help with uh, our scenario guidance as well. In another study, we are looking at the antecedents of TNFD with what we are doing there. We are trying to understand where this TNFD comes from. Also try to look at how many, for example, percentage of the TNFD coming from the existing reporting, for example, sustainable reporting or uh, other CSRD reportings as well to help companies to build their capability beyond what they already have and uh, what they don't know regarding TNFT. So, yeah, that's all what I'm doing. We also work on some nature restoration projects as well with Lancaster Environment Centre as well. Before I let Jan ask the next question, you have my more sympathies because it sounds like you work with Jan even more often than I do. So, yes. Well, he seems to be quite happy. I'm certainly delighted by that. And it's really nice that we have the ability within the Pentland Centre to appoint postdoc research associates to really develop new areas of work where there's virtually nobody doing any work and it's maybe a bit too early to get research funding to do it. So it's very much a developmental role to allow us to advance um, the, the theory and the ideas, but also to support practice at a very early stage. And obviously it ties in a lot with what you do. At Neo's areas of expertise, similar to yours, in, in a good overlap there, hence the connection with the Pentland Centre and bringing Neo in. It is indeed. And, I mean, Neo's spoken a little bit and we've, we keep on teasing our, our listeners about the Task Force for Nature-Related Financial Disclosures. So now is probably the time just to maybe say what is it all about. Yeah. Having been corrected before we started this episode, Jan, it's the Task Force, the task force on Nature-Related Financial oh. Disclosures. Oh. And, and as you're working on it, <laughs> I'd expect you to know that. I'm just going to go TNFD because then we, we, <laughs> yes. we, we know what we mean, but we don't have to get it wrong. Yes. <laughs> For when we say TNFD throughout the rest of this episode, that's what we mean. Yeah. So, yes, uh, uh, go on, Neil. Tell us, what is it? What is the TNFD? 
Well, the TNFT is a new nature reporting framework. Actually, it's just launched in September 2023. It's quite new. So what is TNFT? So TNFT aims to provide companies and financial institutions with uh, risk management and disclosure framework to identify, assess, manage and disclose their nature-related issues, concerns. So the basically TNFT helps business to understand uh, their impacts and dependencies as well as their risk and opportunities. Like in a simple way, we can say that TNFT helps organizations to understand how they impact nature and how nature impacts them. One of the very interesting things about the TNFT is a focus on dependencies. For many years, we've had reporting frameworks and companies have been really aware of their impact on nature or their impact on restoring nature, as we'd seen in the previous um, podcast. But the TNFD uh, starts to reflect the reality that we're living in, which which Henrik Osterblom talked about when he was on the podcast in the last series talking about the Anthropocene, and that is that companies are also critically dependent upon a well-functioning ecosystem. And that's why it's a risk framework, because it's a risk to your business continuity as well as a risk that you present to the natural world. And, and that is like the, the really special and novel thing about... Um, TNFD. And there's other, there's one other task force that does a similar thing, which I'm sure we'll come on to. Well, let's come on to it now. And it is a task force we mentioned last season, about a year ago, actually, when we were speaking to Duncan Pollard, when we spoke about the task force on climate related financial disclosures. So I guess my question is, how do they fit together? Do they fit together? How will they interact? So this is a good question, actually. So the TNFT officially launched in October 2021 and just after six months in, in March 2022, it's just uh, launched the first beta version just in six months. I mean, this is very quick, uh, very short time period. But how TNFT did this one, it comes to your question. Because TNFT heavily builds on TCFT framework. TCFT stands for, as you said, Task Force on uh, Climate-Related Financial Disclosure, which look at the climate-related reporting. So in TCFD, we have four main pillars, governance, strategy, risk management, and uh, targets and metrics. TNFD builds exactly on the same pillars. That's why TNFD uh, is kind of developed a little bit faster than other global uh, disclosures. So... How can companies affect nature then in their operations? So this is also a good question. Thank you very much for the question. So companies can affect nature in many ways. Like as you know, some industries are highly depends on nature, like energy industries, chemicals, pharmacy, agriculture. So companies in these industries, and they affect nature heavily. Imagine a clothing factory located in nearby a river. This clothing factory to produce uh, clothes, they use a lot of water. So uh, they leave less water for the plants, animals, and agriculture purposes there. So if this company doesn't handle their waste properly, they could lead some harmful chemicals to the soil and water as well. So also this clothing company rely on cotton. You know, the cotton needs lots of pesticides to grow which can harm insects and uh, pollute the environment as well. And also, uh, you know, some companies, especially in Europe, they produce their products in, in another company for some cheap labor purposes. So uh, even though they produce their products in another country, they still affect nature through their supply chain. That's why I like TNFT here, because TNFT also take care of supply chain as well, not just companies, its own operation in their own country. That's something that I was just about to ask you then, Neil, because we often talk about the direct effects of what you're doing, but then within a supply chain and how far up and down the supply chain you go, um, there's things that we talk about when it comes to carbon, such as scope one emission, scope two emission, scope three emissions, you know, covering you know stuff that you do directly within your operations, indirect within your operations, and then far, far down. So is it similar with this, the, the effects when it comes to the company's effects on nature, that you have to analyze stuff far, far away from where your core base is? 
Yeah, that's right. You need to analyze all of this and you are also responsible from your supply chain's activities. You need to report them as well. You need to build some strategies for your supply chain to decide how you govern govern your supply chains and also how, what kind of strategies you are going to develop on them and uh, kind of what requirements you are going to ask them to do to be maybe nature positive. And Neo's example of the, the clothing manufacturer and the dyeing and the water is a really good one because it's also where the dependencies come in. And so we've seen, um, you know, it, well, I was going to say recently, but at any time you read the newspaper, there's, there's quite severe floods somewhere. So if you've got a factory and you're using a water resource and it's by a river and the, uh, there's increasing flood risk perhaps because of climate change or maybe deforestation from further up the watershed, then, then that's your critical dependency to have a, a water system that you can access that isn't going to be in, in a state of, of flux. And maybe not so much with cotton, but particularly with you know, food and forestry and agriculture, the dependencies on um, functional soils, on pollinators, on all of those services that people get from nature would also fall within the ambit of the TNFD. So Neo and I um, have been keeping a close eye on those people who are starting to report under this framework. And we're just past the anniversary of the launch of the final version of the standard. So what have you found in that area, Neo? Is this a, is this a, a standard that people are using? Um, and we'll come on to questions about you know, how good their reporting is after that. Yeah, this is a quite good question. <laughs> Like, as I said, TNFT has four pillars, governance, strategy, risk management, and uh, target and metrics. So these four pillars help companies to assess how their governance structures manage nature-related risks, how their strategies incorporate nature into business decisions, how they manage risk, and how they track performance through specific nature-related uh, metrics. So in my experience, my, many companies are still in the early stage of uh, understanding and implementing this disclosure. And so there is, significant, there is a significant variation across industries with some companies making good progress, such as like companies in energy industry and others are lagging, such as uh, seafood companies. But as I said, this is like early stage, so... We should give some time to companies to better understand the TNFD recommendations and increase their in-house capability to disclose better TNFD reports. Yeah, it's hard to say, I guess, when it has only been in place for such a short time, how good these companies are because they've got to get used to it. But can you tell how seriously they're taking it? Are you able to judge after this amount of time whether they realise this is something they actually do need to be doing, even if they're not necessarily fully there yet in being able to do it so uh thanks for the question we had uh, i did read some uh, tnft reports and i can say that uh, the companies are doing good i mean uh, these are new reporting and some aspects of this reporting is quite new like as john said dependencies and also targets and metrics as well based on the availability of the data availability of the data i think they are doing great by looking at the first reports, we cannot make any judgment because first reports are usually like just they are reporting what they know. But probably in like two, three years, they will be better in reporting TNFT. And is this a, a popular activity? Um, how many how many companies have you found that are producing TNFT reports? Oh, this is uh, tricky. <laughs> We have so far 74 companies reported TNFT. We know all of this, but I can say these are all in English language. There are other companies reporting in, for example, Japanese language or Spanish language as well. With them, I think we have over 100 TNFT reports, but in English, so we can only uh, examine the English one. We have 74 reports. Is there anything in common across the type of companies that are filing these reports or indeed the ones that are required to file these reports? And it, whether that's the size of the company, whether that's the type of industry that they're in, what are the commonalities between them? One fourth of the reports coming from Japan, this is like an interesting, it may sound an interesting commonality, but 
if we think that the go- Japanese government has a program since 2009 to promote um, by the to promote by the worst the conservation activities and report on them so this doesn't look interesting uh, if we think about this so also some Japanese companies the influential ones they are reporting TNFT reports earlier than others compared to their peers in the world so this also lead Japanese companies to follow these influential companies there are also some interesting patterns there for example the highly dependent industries like uh, food companies so far we have five food companies they just have TNF to report this is quite less even though they are highly dependent on nature it seems they are lagging behind in the process so also uh, some other countries like Brazil Hong Kong New Zealand Singapore Switzerland UK and EU countries TCFT is mandated in mandated in these countries So it seems these countries also leading on TNFT reporting as well. There could be a spillover effect here. Maybe these companies in these countries they may affect TNFT. They become mandatory as uh, like TCFT soon as well. Do you, so just to interrupt, do you think that that there's a relation there because maybe the same departments, the same people within these companies are taking responsibility for TNFD who've taken responsibility for TCFD reporting and maybe therefore it's easier for them to double up almost. Yeah, that's right. That's why some companies are producing TCFD and TNFD uh, reporting, climate and nature reporting. They are integrating this reporting and actually this is the one recommendation from TNFD they recommend to produce climate and nature scenarios. And I think what's really interesting about those patterns that we observed is that um, you asked, Paul, whether, you know, how the, is this required? So at the moment, TNFD isn't formally required by anyone anywhere. Um, but it's quite interesting that the places where TCFD has been formally required, we're seeing a bit of an uptick in the reporting. And that's not to say that it, may, it might not be formally required at some stage uh, in the future, but what we think are more likely to happen is that you'll get that climate nature reporting and so it actually almost will bunny hop over and become something quite different. So it might be that TNFD is a moment in time which is a bridge between no reporting and a certain mm-hmm. type of reporting. I guess this goes to both of you because you both do the work together. Do you think there's some kind of influence of investors in this kind of thing? We've talked in the past about responsible investing, about people wanting to invest in companies that show they're doing well in terms of sustainability activity. Therefore, are there going to be certain markets around the world that this will take off in more because maybe there's more green investing, responsible investing in those markets? Um, It could be. And what's interesting about these task force uh, reporting requirements is it's not purely for companies, it's also for investors as well. So some banks have been very early um, uh, generators of reports of this nature, so that would help it join up. And I suppose maybe returning back to the Japanese point, you know, the Japanese government has given a really strong stare. And and, um, I think Neo and I disagree slightly on whether or not the high incidence of Japanese companies are remarkable. It's not remarkable when you know they've been through a process to produce them, but what remar- what is remarkable is the Japanese government has innovated in that way. So between governments, um, investors and stock exchanges and companies' own um, motivations for doing it, we're seeing these three forms come together to really en- encourage in particular industries and particular places this kind of work. Do you agree, Neil? No, where do you disagree with Jan? I'm, all, I'm always keen to find out where people don't agree with Jan because, you know, I don't agree with Jan on lots of things. It's a cute benchmarking. I don't know if you ever spoke to yeah. uh, about benchmarking. Maybe we can pass this question. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what aspects of it do you think of maybe slightly differently to Jan then? We're, we're gazing at each other and um, I'm trying not to look threatening, but I fear I might be. <laughs> I, I did notice before I kept referring to you as Professor Jan Babington as if you held something over him because he had to tell you your, 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 your complete he's just, title. He's just respectful. Just polite, respectful, yeah. unlike other people in the studio. Yeah, I, I, I'm, yeah, I, I know who you're talking about and I, yeah, there's a reason for that, Jan. No, well, it, it's good to know, Jan, that someone else disagrees with you on lots of things because, you know, I disagree with you on many, many things. I, I, I like Neil all the more for knowing that he doesn't necessarily agree with you on everything as regards to this. Um, 
So the TNFD, it's all about the idea that you need to know what possible futures we might be facing. So there's a desire to create biodiversity scenarios. So why is that? Why are scenarios part of the framework? So because biodiversity scenarios are important, because nature-related risks are highly uncertain and complex, just like climate change. So why biodiversity scenarios are part of the framework? Because scenarios uh, allow companies to explore multiple possible futures and assess how change in nature risk might affect their operations, supply chains, and financial stability. So scenarios can help uh, businesses to become more resilient for the possible future. That's why I think the why scenarios are part of the framework. Okay, well, what is a scenario then in, in this case? There are like a long definition of scenario, scientific de- scenar- definition, but we can just simply say that scenarios, scenario analysis is a method for exploring different possible future outcomes when things are uncertain. So this is, in short, we can say this. So scenarios are not predictions. We are not predicting future. We are just making some assumptions based on probably today's uh, reality. Oh, no, there are different types of scenarios. There are more than six, seven different types of scenarios, like predictive scenarios, exploratory scenarios, normative scenarios, policy scenarios, reference scenarios, and so on. But since we are talking about TNFT, TNFT uh, recommends two different types of scenarios on their scenario guidance, which are exploratory scenarios and normative scenarios. So in normative scenarios, they are constructed to lead to a future that is desired by the scenario builders. So in normative scenarios, we have a target to reach in the future. Like uh, the climate scenarios are a good example of normative scenarios. Think about like we have 1.5 degree target for a company for the next 10 years. So and then this company need to reduce, for example, their carbon emission by 40%. Uh, please pay attention that these are all our quantitative uh, figures, you know, 1.5 and 40%. They need to uh, reduce the uh, carbon emission. So they set up different scenarios based on uh, their target to reach this target. For example, the target is there 1.5 degree. So they need to reduce their uh, carbon emission by 40% in the next 10 years. So to reach these targets, they, for example, build three different scenarios in a good way, in a good narrative uh, scenario. If the things work well, I mean the physical and transition risk, maybe we can also talk about this. When I say physical risk, uh, we are talking about some like extreme weathers or like storms, droughts, that kind of physical uh, climate-related things. When we say transition risk, we are talking about regulation, technological change, change in customer test, that kind of things. So uh, in a good scenario, as I said, what can we say? Like in a good scenario, if the uh, physical risk are, doesn't change that much and trans and the companies adopt transitions risk well, so they build scenarios, have they reached this 1.5 degree? If in a bad scenario, if things goes very bad, like if we had very uh, heavy climate uh, physical risk and then if trans- if company cannot adapt the transition risk well. So in this case, how they are going to reach targets, they are building their narratives on this way. And there is also like in maybe in mid scenarios, if the things like go smooth as today's, how they are going to reach these targets. So in normative scenarios, we have a target in the future to reach. But in exploratory scenarios, What we have, there is no specific target here, but instead we have a range of potential features based on different assumptions today. So exploratory scenarios start in the present today and set up assumptions to explore possible future developments. So to give an example for this, like we talk about clothing factory, so uh, suppose that like this clothing factory wants to build a scenarios for the next 10 years, 50 years or 100 years, you can build your scenarios for the next 100 years as well, for example. So this company wants to build scenario based on, for example, three assumptions as we talk about normative scenarios. 
So there is no target in the future. They just want to make some assumptions from today's trends to uh, make sure that companies are still operating normally uh, in the future. So in bad scenarios, if, for example, biodiversity declined, uh, and this is physical risk, and if they cannot adopt the transition risk as well, how they are going to operate in a normal way in these bad scenarios in the next 100 years, for example. In a good scenario, if things work well, I mean, if biodiversity decline is not that fast, if the companies are doing great for transition risk, so how they are going to survive for the next 100, 100 years in this way. And in we have also in mid scenario as well, if things are as usual today. In these expertise scenarios, we are making possible assumptions for the future based on the current trends. By the way, TNFT suggests exploratory scenarios because, as I said, like uh, because in normative scenarios we have uh, a lot of quantitative data, but when it comes to biodiversity, we still don't have enough uh, metrics to measure biodiversity. That's w- that's one reason why uh, TNFT suggests exploratory scenarios. Another one is like, uh, as I said, like in climate scenarios, we have 1.5 degree. This is a uh, this uh, global commonly agreed targets for all companies. So we don't have such global target for biodiversity still. That's why TNFT suggests exploratory scenarios. And indeed, those nature scenarios and climate scenarios are linked together. And um, as as Neo said, the other problem with the nature scenarios is it depends on where you are. So, so climate change is about the the amount of greenhouse gases in the the entire atmosphere, whereas nature scenarios are built around particular places with particular dynamics. So the data requirements to understand what's happening is enormous. And I've always thought of that as a huge disadvantage. But I was at a workshop last week where somebody said, "But the upside is that something happens somewhere with." people in the community and with an actual physical location and and that actually makes it more understandable and more likely to engender action. So so whereas uh, you know, before last week I thought the place-based nature of nature was a real problem in this area, I now can see that there's some really good opportunities because things happen somewhere and people care about the somewhere where it happens. So lots and lots of scenario building then, lots and lots of scenarios. And I like the fact you called them flavours because I just said, yeah, we'll have the salt and vinegar flavour scenario today <laughs> or the prawn cocktail one. And depending upon your preference for different types of crisps, one of those would be a nightmare scenario. One of them would be a dream scenario. Indeed. Uh, have you seen any really inspirational examples of companies developing these kind of scenarios? Actually, yes. We have only one scenario uh, related to biodiversity. This scenario comes from Kao Corporation from Japan. They did build uh, scenarios in their TNFT report. This is part of uh, strategy pillar, strategy pillar and C sub pillars. But we cannot say that whether this scenario analysis by Kao is good or bad because this is the only scenario. Uh, it seems they did something good, but interestingly, they used uh, climate scenarios as well in their TNFT by the worst scenarios. For me, I think they did this one to co- be able to quantify biodiversity because it's not easy to quantify biodiversity. So they have uh, climate scenarios that easy to easy to quantify scenarios with climate scenarios. I guess they did it for these purposes. Well, you know, this has been a really, really fascinating conversation. I've really liked discovering a lot more about the TNFD. So that's the task force on nature-related financial disclosures, Jan, since you well, need to learn that, well obviously, pointed your out. work. Yep. Um, it's been great having you on here as a guest. Thank you. And um, and I, I was, uh, well, because we work together, we kind of know what's going on, but it's it's always really lovely to hear someone talk about it sometimes in a different way and prompt different thoughts in my mind, even though we're working on this project together. Thanks very much, Neil. Thank you for inviting me again. So, Paul, did you find out a lot about nature in that one? I did. I found out a lot about the work that you're doing. Because it's always interesting. I, you know, we talk all the time, but we, we talk so much about the work that other people are doing and we don't always get to talk about the work that you're doing. Yeah, and I mean, I love this project and it's an absolute treat to have Neo 
you know, as part of the team and, and really doing the heavy lifting of the analysis and the finding of things and, and then together we can craft a, you know, an understanding of what's going on. So he's, he's, he's brilliant. It's really great to have him on board. And we've done a couple of episodes now essentially on the two task forces. We did the one with Duncan Pollard that I referenced earlier last year on the task force for climate-related financial disclosures and now this one on task force on nature-related financial disclosures. And it seems that there's a real pickup amongst corporations on the realisation that these kind of reporting this kind of work recognising your impacts on both the climate and nature are more and more important. And, and more holistic. And so that whole, there's, it's holistic across those two dimensions of looking at climate and nature together, but also holistic at looking at impact and dependency. And then really holistic about not just now, but in the future. So I think that reflects a, a much more sophisticated understanding on behalf of those people who make uh, the, the standards, but also induces a more sophisticated understanding in the corporations of their whole picture, the whole impact across many dimensions and many places. And I, that's what we need to be able to um, have corporate biosphere stewardship and to have good operations in the Anthropocene. And it's interesting to see how the companies where the reporting on climate-related financial disclosures was already in place are the ones that maybe are picking up quicker than nature-related financial disclosures. And I can tend to see both positives and negatives in that. Um, positives in that, well, they're picking it up and they're getting the ideas and obviously it's working well with them. Negatives in that you worry, well, are they just dumping more work on the same people who are having to do more and more on all of this and they're not recognising that maybe they need particular specialists on each area? And I think maybe in the short term there is a sense in which this does create work and, and stress for organisations, but in the longer term the, the desire of the standard setters and certainly our desires as, as researchers is that this will mean that in the future companies will be more resilient to shocks, more able to um, navigate the, the environment that they're based within, near really helpfully distinguished between the physical risk and then the transition risk, so able to do better because I've had to think these kind of things through. And I, I bumped into a company, a Swedish company, who, who was really interesting. So they're caught under the EU regulations for um, uh, CSRD, so the, the Corporate Responsibility um, uh, Disclosure Standard, and they are going to do one TNFD report because that will help them really understand their context so they can then do that that legislated and required report later on. And that's the first time in my career I've seen people using um, a reporting standard as a stepping stone to something else. Mm -hmm. So it might be that we have you know two or three years with TNFD reports and then for all intents and purposes they disappear, but that knowledge and understanding is mainstream and incorporated into other reporting and other approaches. And because it's such a young thing as well, you will only hopefully see it grow and develop in a positive way over these coming years. And if we were to have had this podcast in five years' time, I dare say the discussion will be entirely different to when we're having it now. For sure. And, and for our listeners, I'd like to, you to hold this thought because in a, in a few weeks' time, we're going to have Carlos Laranaga speaking to us. And part of Carlos's expertise is understanding when things become normal for companies. And so at this stage with the TNFD and these early adopters, these are quite unusual organisations because they've taken the step early. But as it becomes mainstream and more people do it, the whole dynamic of um, both standard setting but also reporting changes over time and there's almost a life cycle of, of norms that come into it but I know Carlos will be much more articulate and, and eloquent than me in laying that out for us um, uh, on the podcast. Before that next week we'll be talking with Dr Catherine Ellsworth-Krebs and she's going to be talking about the kind of people who may be uh, in some companies have got the responsibility for these kind of reports and task forces and she's going to be talking about her work with sustainability managers, their roles in business and how all that fits together so that's going to be another fascinating episode. And a nice continuity as you say in that these are the guys that are doing TNFD reports. Well until then thank you very much for listening I'm Paul Turner and I'm Professor Jane Babington. 